Welcome to uh, our info session on Fulbright Hayes DDRA. My name is Kristen Connors. I'm the project director for DDRA at UH Manoa. I work in graduate division. I'll be one of just one of the presenters along with two of our DDRA fellows, um, Caroline uh, Basie from uh, the 2022 year, and then our newest fellow, Olivia Meyer from 2023. So at this time, I'd like to invite my fellow presenters to please uh, share their videos and introduce themselves. Caroline, would you like to go first? Uh, sure. Um, so I'm Caroline. Uh, I'm from the history department. Um, and yeah, I was part of the DDRA 2022, um, and I went to Spain and the Philippines for my dissertation research. It took about, it was eight months of research, but yeah. Thank you. Olivia? Hi, everyone. I'm Olivia. I'm a third year PhD candidate in geography and environment. Um, yeah, as Kristen said, I just got awarded the Fulbright case. So I haven't done my research yet, but the application process is fresh in my mind. So I'm looking <laughs> forward to sharing any tips. Thank you so much. Um, and as you can see by the disclaimer on the screen, uh, the information that we are presenting today is based on past competition information because the FY24 information has not yet been released. If you want, you can check this URL that we've included here on this page for the Department of Education for any updates about the next DDRA competition. So now because we are going to be discussing international research, I'd like to leave you with some thoughts to consider. Uh, you're, you could be going anywhere in the world. And so wherever your dissertation project takes you, I really encourage you to be mindful of place. And when I say place, I mean that to include history, people, land. Okay, so the all of it, the full context. And as a visitor or guest or however you identify in relation to that place, please consider thinking about the full context of your positionality in relation to that place. Thank you for letting me share that. Okay, so the DDRA application is a pretty big undertaking. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover today. I highly recommend that even after attending this webinar, that you please go back and watch the recording to make sure that you have a full understanding of the opportunity, the expectations, and the application process. This is the only inf information session we offer before the competition opens. And our main objective today is for you to walk away with an understanding of the main purpose of Fulbright Hayes DDRA and understand um, how to apply as a UH Manoa doctoral student, okay? Uh, we want to emphasize advice and tips on how to prepare for the application process and how to create a competitive application. At the end of the presentation, we'll save whatever time is left for Q&A. Again, we are recording this webinar today and we will email a link to everyone uh, once that is available. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, again, this is Fulbright Hayes, DDRA. This is not the Fulbright U.S. student program. Those are two completely different opportunities, even though they both hold the Fulbright name. Okay, so this opportunity is sponsored through the Department of Education, which means it has different a different mission and goal. It does not include an ambassadorship. You're not expected to have community engagement um, like the Fulbright U.S., program. This, fo this is focused on research, specifically your dissertation research. There are two main components to this opportunity, which is you must be conducting your research in a foreign country, and you must be using a foreign language to conduct that research, okay? Um, so this is not about using English in your research in another country. This is not about teaching English. This is not about pursuing a graduate degree abroad. This is doctoral dissertation research utilizing a foreign language in a foreign country. You do not need to be at the point of ABD when you apply. Again, we'll go over that a little bit um, in the uh, uh, eligibility criteria, um, but if you are awarded, you do need to be ABD by the time you start your fellowship. Okay, um, so speaking of eligibility requirements, 
This is not open to international students. I'm just going to make that very clear from the get go. OK, um, so if you are an international student and you are on this webinar, um, I'm sorry, this is not open to you. You're more than welcome to reach out to me and we can talk about some other opportunities that you can apply for. You must be a U.S. citizen and a permanent resident. OK, um, fellowship is open to most fields. Again, it's it's it focuses on area studies. You should have the intention of going into professoriate or um, some kind of teaching plan um, after you graduate with your PhD. If you're not planning a career in teaching, you could still apply. There are ways to kind of get around that with the eligibility. So for example, maybe if your area of study is pertinent to US national security, um, the knowledge of the country um, or your study area is pertinent to various fields of government, international development, or certain professions, um, you may still be a, a good candidate for DDRA. Okay. Um, however, again, just know that the intent is for those planning a career in teaching. If you've defaulted on any federal student loans, you're ineligible to apply. That is something that we have to check on. Um, and just in general, if you're unsure about the eligibility requirements, um, but you're interested in DDRA, just reach out to me directly. Let's have a conversation um, to make sure, uh, you know, whether or not this is the right opportunity for you. One of the things to note about DDRA is that there are priorities for this competition. There is an absolute priority and there are competitive preference priorities. So the absolute priority is that you have to be conducting research um, in one of these specified geographic areas. Now, let me let me just add a little caveat to that. So I know it says, that, you know, Africa, East Asia, Southeast Asia, right? You're, and you might be thinking, oh, great. Yeah, I, I'm going to do dissertation research in one of those regions. However, once the competition opens, there will be a document that is published called the maintenance allowance table and it will list every single country that they are funding research for okay and if your country is listed but it says closed it means that you cannot apply for ddra so for example if you were to look at the maintenance allowance table for this past year it lists china but it says closed which means that if you're if you were planning to do research in China for fiscal year 23, you could not apply for DDRA. OK, so just because your country falls into the region that might be listed, it doesn't mean that you may be able to apply. OK, so you, you want to make sure to check the maintenance allowance table. Um, the absolute priority means that you have to meet this requirement in order to apply. Okay. The competitive preference priorities you don't have to meet, but it is significantly towards your advantage because as we will say repetitively throughout this webinar, every single point counts. So you might say, oh, well, thematic focus on academic fields, that's only two points, who cares? Um, or focus on less commonly taught languages. Oh, well, I'm doing French or I'm doing Spanish. That's okay, I can do without those two points. Actually, it can make a difference because these, those two points could mean the difference of you being selected as a principal candidate, meaning you get the award, or you being categorized as an alternate, or you not even being selected um, for, for either of those. Um, positions. Okay, so really every single point counts. Um, and then the last competitive preference priority is um, about minority serving institutions. So those are two automatic points that you will get as an applicant, because we UH Manoa, um, it, we are a minority serving institution. Okay. Okay, so if you are awarded um, just know that this is one of the best funded opportunities out there for you. Um, essentially, what you do is you propose how long you're going to be doing your research for. It has to fall within a six to a 12 month period. Um, and then you create a budget for your dissertation research project um, that will include things like travel costs, um, your maintenance allowance, which is, you know, like your living expenses, rent, food you know, local transportation to get around. Um, it can include dependence allowance. So if you um, are married, have children, right? 
they can get sponsored and, and come with you for the full length of your research, right? Health and accident assurance, uh, insurance, um, project allowance. These are all things that get covered, right? Uh, because there's a lot of opportunities out there that will provide a, a significant amount of funding, but won't fund you for everything. And, and, and this is a great one because basically whatever you put in your budget, that's what you're going to get covered for if you're awarded. Um, as far as tuition assistance, because you're required to remain enrolled as you do your dissertation research internationally, graduate division will pay for your one credit of dissertation each semester that you're abroad. So for example, Olivia is planning to be abroad for three semesters. So we will cover dissertation, that one credit of dissertation for her for three semesters. Okay, you are still responsible for your student fees that does not get covered um, by DDRE funding, so you do have to find funding for that or pay for that out of pocket. Okay, um, and while you are looking for other funding, just know that there are no duplicate funding, um, you know, permitted. So, for example, if you get a scholarship, um, you know, or or grant to pay for research expenses or for travel expenses, just know that you have to disclose that to DDRA and then DDRA will not fund you for those things because you, you can't have duplicate funding. Um, there, you can't also have duplicate federal funding. So if you are awarded Fulbright US and you're awarded Fulbright Hayes DDRA, you're going to have to choose one or the other. You, you can't accept both um, unless there is no overlapping period for the research. Oh, last thing is that you cannot have a graduate assistantship while you are abroad. Okay, so that is not permitted. This is an overview of the timeline to anticipate again until the competition actually opens. We won't know the actual timeline, but based on the past couple of years, this is what it's looked like. Um, for the past two years. So if it goes in line um, with what we've seen in the past, this is what you can kind of expect, uh, which is that around February, we'll hear from the Department of Ed that the competition is open. I will send an email out to all doctoral students um, announcing what you need to do if you're interested in applying. You will need to tell me that you plan to apply, um, please do not just submit everything in the system and then I find out last minute and then I'm trying to rush to work with you um, because we might not be able to put together a, a competitive application or worst case scenario, you may have done all the work only for me to review everything and tell you that you're not actually eligible to apply. So that's why it's really important that as soon as I send the email out or even before then, if you're interested, if you know you're gonna apply for this, that you please email me um, to let me know that, that this is what you would like to do. Um, and in fact, what I'll do right now, that you have that is I just put my email um, address in the chat box. Once the competition is open, I normally give students about three to four weeks to turn everything around and submit it um, so that I can review things, work with you to finalize your part of the application. Um, there are things that I have to do and I cannot do until you've completed your part. Um, and then I also need approval from the UH Office of Research Services in order for us to submit our application. So. This is why you have a very, very short turnaround time. You only have three to four weeks to get everything done. Um, so when you read the solicitation and it says, oh, the application isn't due to April, that's not your deadline. That's that's the institution's deadline. That's UH Manoa's deadline. Um, so I will be very clear in my email out to students what your deadline is to get everything in. So please pay attention to the email that I send out because I will give you the details of your deadline to me. Um, once everything is submitted by, by UH Manoa, uh, normally between um, late spring um, to summer is when the National Committee is reviewing your application. Around August or September, more likely September, we hear back um, with the scoring of each of your applications and whether or not you've been selected as a principal alternate or not selected at all. Uh, we then have a short turnaround time to accept the award, and then we begin the orientation process and, and the planning for you to depart. You will not be able to depart any earlier than January 2025. 
And depending how long you're planning for your research, that six to 12 months, um, you must return by March 2026. Um, so you and I will, will again plan out your application on what that time period is that you're looking at to do your research. Okay, so what is included is, is listed here on this slide. Even though the competition hasn't opened, it is not too early to start preparing, okay? There are a lot of these things that you can begin working on now. You already know what your research project is. You can be working on an abstract, okay? And, and let me just warn you, it's 120 words. That's how short it is. It's very difficult to get your abstract down to 120 words. So that could be something you could be working on now is, is how to pare it down. To, to be that concise. You have to list all your previous overseas travel. Maybe your family took a trip when you were three years old. Maybe um, you were part of a military family and you hopped around from place to place every so many years. Maybe you did a study abroad as an undergrad. Um, maybe you just, you did a mission trip, you know, for two weeks with your church. So start putting that list together. That's something you can work on now. Propose budget, start thinking about what are the things that you need to include on your budget? How much do you think it's gonna cost, right? How much is that airfare, that round trip airfare gonna cost, right? How much do you need for circuit supplies? Do you need to start um, reaching out to your doctor? We all know it can take months to get an appointment. You can start working on your CV. If there are things you haven't updated for a while, start working on that now. Um, the application narrative, which is generally the guidelines say it's a 10 page research project proposal. Um, you can start drafting that. You can look at what the guidelines were from last year um, and start working on that. Uh, you can also start putting together your two page bibliography. Um, host country supporting materials. Oh, this is so key. So in order to do your research abroad, you need to have an, a host country affiliate. So that's normally like a university, research institution, um, government agency, someone who's gonna sponsor you, um, or sorry, I shouldn't say sponsor, someone who's gonna support your research project while you are in country and provide resources, um, contacts, networking, um, support in various ways, could just be office space, could be access to, um, you know, library, archives, etc. Um, so you're going to need to get a letter from that host affiliate to include in your application. And so start thinking about, oh, if I'm going to be working with a university, are their offices going to be closed for the months of December to January for vacation? And I'm not going to be able to get in touch with anyone. I should start reaching out now. Um, do you not have an affiliate? If not, you should get started now because I'm just going to tell you, it can take six to nine months to find an affiliate. Um, and the application is, is going to be due as early as February or March. Transcripts, you're going to have to get um, copies of, of all your transcripts. So, uh, you know, is that something that you need to start looking, looking into how to do? References, one of whom has to be your dissertation chair. I think it's a good idea to start reaching out now to references and, and letting them know you're interested in applying for DDRA, um, giving them an idea of, of what an anticipated timeline is because maybe they're gonna be on sabbatical next semester. Maybe they're gonna be um, at a conference or doing field work for a significant part of, of you know, when the application is due and they'll be hard to get in touch with. So you know, reaching out now may not be a bad idea to start planning ahead. Language evaluations will be required. Uh, so whatever foreign language you'll be doing your international research in, you need to have a faculty from a university uh, conduct that language evaluation if it's a, not so common language. Um, so maybe a language that isn't normally taught at a university. There are other um, resources you can reach out to for the language evaluation and, and you can contact me if you have questions about that. Um, but that needs to be done as well. And, and sometimes that's not so easy to coordinate. Um, so again, trying to reach out now to find someone would be a good idea. Um, and then the last component is the human subjects narrative. Um, that's something that is detailed in the solicitation and that I would work with you on. So once you contact me to let me know that you're interested in applying, you and I will, will discuss what is required for that. 
let's see, anything else I can say about that? Oh, the PDFs have to be what we call flat PDFs. So that means it can't have any passwords embedded, um, no protection. So it's it's the equivalent of when you convert something to PDF, like you're gonna print it. It's it's not the image of it, but it's um, there's no nothing embedded with the PDF. So just please keep that in mind. For the application narrative, which is your research project proposal, I will work hand in hand with you on editing that. So I would like to see a draft of your project proposal um, so that you and I can can work on, you know, making it the most competitive um, version that it can be. I generally do provide you this outline um, and some tips on how to draft or, or put together a good narrative. Um, not every narrative will fall every part, every um, bullet point on here because maybe it flows better in a different order based on your discipline or, or what you're proposing. Um, but generally, um, these are some good guidelines to follow when you're putting your narrative together. These are going to be the steps that you'll want to follow um, if you will be applying for DDRA. And again, like I said, this is a very entailed process um, and it may seem overwhelming, which is why we're having the information session now so that you can get a head start and, and space everything out and prepare things in advance. I cannot stress enough how important it is to read every detail of the Federal Register notice to make sure that you understand the application information because there are things that can change from year to year. There is something that is included in the application information called the technical review. It's literally the scoring sheet that reviewers use when they are looking at your application. And that is your best guide on how to tailor your application and your narrative um, to make sure that you are including every single point that is on that technical review so that you can maximize the points that will be awarded to you by reviewers. Contact me again if, you, if you're planning on applying uh, and if you definitely know that you want to apply. There's going to be a new application system that's launched this year. It's G6, so uh, you can go ahead and register and create an account for yourself. You're going to need to put in the reference and language evaluators. Um, just know that if they are not in the U.S., they may need to be able to connect to a U.S. server. Uh, in order to submit their information. Uh, there have been problems in the past with people who are abroad trying to submit things through an international server uh, because G6 is monitored by the federal government. You'll need to complete the online application. You'll need to upload scanned copies of your transcripts. You'll need to scrub any personally identifiable information. So that's things like date of birth, address, uh, social security number, things like that. You and, I, you and I, again, will work on your IRB narrative, and you'll need to send that to me so that I can submit that as, as the overall application from the institution. Once everything's been completed on your part uh, by the campus deadline, you'll go ahead and let me know so that I can review it one more time, make sure that there are no technical issues uh, and that everything is good to go for submission. Some things that I do want to point out when you're drafting or sorry, when you're putting everything together with the online application and the narratives and bibliography, et cetera, uh, you cannot have any special characters. Uh, so no Okinas, no Kahakos, Tildes, none of that. You can't have any of, of those uh, in your documents. Okay. Let's see anything. Oh, please back up and save all documents um, because the G and, and this is a tip we'll include later. Um, the the app the G six application system or at least G five used to um, shut down a lot um, or have issues. So that was one of the fixes they were hoping uh, to work on with G six. Hopefully, um, you don't run into those problems, um, but do save um, copies of things um, in case there are issues with the system. Okay. This is a breakdown of what the point system looks like for scoring. And again, uh, there is that technical review form that you'll be able to look at as part of the application materials that will give you 
further breakdown of what's included in the quality of proposed project and what's included in the qualifications of applicants. Uh, so what I tell students is basically use that as a checklist. And as you go through your application, look at the technical review and see, did I include this? How well did I answer this? Or how well did I complete this element of the application? And then check that off as you go through things. Um, so I know that was a lot of information. Uh, I want to turn things over to our fellows uh, who have a wealth of information to share as well. So Caroline, would you like to uh, come back on and, and talk about uh, your DDRA experience and, um, uh, and then we'll go on to Olivia. So. Sure. Um, so my DDRA experience was was wonderful. Um, so I did research in two different countries, three three different cities in two different countries for eight months. Um, so I was in Spain and in the Philippines uh, working on my um, dissertation for the history department. Um, so I was able to, through, through the DDRA, um, as well as the institutions that I was affiliated with in both Spain and the Philippines, I was able to basically um, get a lot of access to um, various museums, archives, um, libraries that weren't, that didn't even necessarily even have websites. So, um, yeah, I, I, it was, it was, I feel like, I mean, even I did eight months and, um, <laughs> I should have added, I, I was telling Kristen earlier, but I should have added more time. <laughs> um, but yeah. Thank you, Olivia. Do you want to share about what you're planning to do uh, when you leave the spring? Sure. Um, so hi, everyone, again. Um, I am planning to do research in Thailand. So um, it's primarily a qualitative ethnographic project that has mixed methods. Um, but that means I'll, I'll be in Thailand for 12 months. Um, and so it took yeah, it's a really good grant for that because it's rare to find a grant that will support so much time. Um, and I'll be doing interviews, participant observations to learn about um, how different folks are engaging with circular economies, which is a, a sustainability model uh, in Thailand. Um, so yeah, I haven't done it yet, um, but if you have research that sort of draws on qualitative work or as environmental, I'm happy to um, answer questions if they overlap at all. Um, yeah, and I think I think that's it. <laughs> Moving on to application is where I can share more. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so we've compiled um, a bunch of recommendations for the application process. Um, so the first one is to start early. Um, I'm sure that folks start working on their proposals um, early on in their in their programs, but um, yeah, you can never start too early. So like Kristen said, there's so many steps, um, the earlier the better. Um, requesting example applications and how others projects were evaluated in the past is really helpful. Um, I was lucky I have two students in my department who had recently gotten Fulbright. So that was Foley and Michelle. They were really, really helpful for my application. Um, applying for as many grants as possible. That's a huge one. I definitely had rejections along the way from other grants. Um, and every time it's super helpful because it helps you um, figure out what you can do better. Um, I had applied for the Fulbright US student grant and uh, was an alternate, but didn't get it. And that was great because it made me uh, like work and develop on my proposal earlier. Um, so that was, that was really helpful. Um, and don't take it personally. I feel like something to remind yourself of is that you have a lot of talents and skills that the university doesn't recognize. It's just about um, choosing the ones that really fit the mission of that grant and making sure you're putting those forward. Um, have a backup plan for references. Uh, I think this one is just you're dependent on so many different people for your evaluations, for your letters, and um, everyone has busy lives and is doing different things and circumstances change. So just make sure that you you have backup plans if things um, take a turn. Um, cultivate letters of institutional support early and build a strong relationship. 
Um, I think this looks different for everyone. For me, I had two letters. One was from a faculty member that I had a pre-existing relationship with, and then one was um, from another faculty member that I developed a relationship with during pre-dissertation field work. So that one's a bit newer. Um, but I, yeah, I think that a lot of folks would say that can take a long time as well. Um, so just the earlier, the better. Um, and then finally, provide tailored information to references so that they can highlight relevant experience in your letters. Um, so something I do whenever I ask my advisor for a letter of recommendation is give like bullet points of the aspects of my experience or CV that I think are um, most important to highlight uh, for that application, just because you're going to be more familiar with what that grant's looking for and all the roles and things more than your letter writers, most likely. Um, so it's just helpful to give them that as a starting point. Um, and Caroline, anything to add on this slide? Uh, yeah, so um, in terms of references, I, I also think that you should highlight the fact that um, or ask your uh, references to speak to the uh, speak to how you um, your work embodies the work that has been undertaken previously if previously by the Fulbright Hayes DDRA. Um, so for me, I that's what I asked. Um, and I also spoke to one of uh, my uh, references who had he who also had the Fulbright haze when he was doing his dissertation. Um, so he's so he was able to highlight um, how my research would uh, how my research fits into um, a lot of the like what the Fulbright haze is uh, focusing on specifically in terms of the people that they are funding. Um, in terms of uh, the letters of institutional support, um, there are some institutions where you actually have to apply. Um, so Kristen and I actually went through this kind of cyclical process where uh, when I was applying to Ateneo for a institutional affiliation, uh, they were requiring proof of um, funding uh, so that they can give me a letter uh, stating that I have institutional support, but that institutional support letter is what I needed to get the funding. So it was this kind so you kind of have to explain to them as well what's going on. So I was able to get a conditional um, acceptance uh, and that's basically stated um, from Ateneo that I will get um, my affiliation as soon as I have some kind of proof from Fulbright Hayes that I have received the funding. So you have to also think about that, about like um, issues with not just like uh, cultivating relationships, but some institutions are very, and you'll see this um, a lot in Southeast Asia if you're applying there. Um, it's very bureaucratic. There is a lot of paperwork and they love applications. So um, make sure you look into that if you are looking at university um, affiliation uh, in institutions in Southeast Asia, but yeah. Can I jump in here and add something about the reference letters? Uh, so it's really important to make clear to whoever will be writing those letters that they should be speaking towards your qualifications as a researcher, um, what value your research brings to your field and beyond your discipline. Those are three major points that need to be made in the letters. They don't need to talk about how great you are and you know what trials or challenges you've overcome. Um, you know the focus of this is research. Fulbright Hayes wants to know what kind of researcher you are, what you're contributing um, to the field, to the world of you know to the to area studies. Um, you know why you're conducting this research, um, and so just. Keep, keep that focus in mind again. So again, distinction between Fulbright US and Fulbright Hayes. So, okay. Um, okay, I know there's some more tips and advice that Caroline and Olivia had put together. So. Uh, yeah, so, okay, yeah. Um, the system for application goes down a lot. I've like, um, it's even the case with regards to um, when you're, advise when when your references submit their um, letters sometimes it it does something weird so you have to double check everything so double check everything constantly save as soon as you upload like even a single line of like uh, just like for one section you need to be saving 
constantly and you need to be also having some sort of backup um so yeah and then um addressing every point so yeah you should always go over the technical review um and make sure that your uh, every aspect of your application is covering um the requirements that they're going to cover in the technical review in the in the way in which they score it um because basically um if you get the fulbright the haze you actually get your score back and you see basically that they break down every single aspect and you can see the point system uh, you can see the system you can see what you've missed um so they are very they uh, they uh, the people who are scoring um your um application are focused uh, they will utilize the sheet they will basically have it right next to them while they're looking through your entire application um basically the next point all well, uh, feedback is good feedback um so i worked with uh kristen i worked with my academic i worked with my dissertation advisor i also worked with friends outside of my department because it has to your application, especially your uh, proposal, your research proposal, has to be legible to someone who is not a specialist. Um, so you need to make sure that you're not using all of these, you're not focusing on theory, like heavy, heavy theory. Um, you're not utilizing very technical language. Um, and then you're also providing a lot of background to things that you or your department might take for granted as like being part of so it's good to have a large pool of people being like hey you need to you need to figure out how to reword this 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 word is a made up word that your department uses that kind of thing um so yeah just make sure that um and it's like tied to this editing process this idea of look having multiple people go through your um application and rewriting and editing based on their suggestions and also rethinking um things the next thing is highlight language and um area uh area studies basically your area experiences um but so for that um mine's mine was a bit strange um i was lucky that i was you, I was using Tagalog as well as Spanish because I probably wouldn't have gotten points if it was just Spanish for um, my um, for my language aspect. Um, one of the things that I noticed when I actually got back the technical review is that um, the reviewers actually made note of my time overseas as a selling point to why I like why like my ability to do research overseas. So that's so that's why uh, Kristen was highlighting that you need to, you should start making a list of all of your international travel because of the fact that it actually they actually brought it up. So um, highlight that highlight. Also, I would I would argue that even in your uh, proposal, you should highlight um, any kind of um, research you've done. Um, another thing that you should highlight is basically if you should try to hopefully um, start putting out research articles. Um, that's another thing that they really highlighted is if you're already publishing or have attempted to start publishing. So it's not just publishing, but also you are attending conferences that are not just graduate conferences, but and conferences in like uh, different cities or different countries as well. So all of this can be pulled into um basically any part you can kind of utilize it throughout your application as well um the next point don't justify your research by filling a void i mean that's a very big trope stay away from anything that says void basically um highlight how your work is challenging um some like the standards that are set like for uh, for my for me i i i highlighted how um my research is kind of going beyond um, what was already previously uh, discussed in relation to my research subject, my research topic. Um, try to connect your research to what is happening in the world today. That's another thing that's very important is to see the relevance of your research. It can't be just like, oh, I really just like studying 
ancient Sumerian, <laughs> I don't know, language or something like that, because it's interesting. It has to highlight how th there needs to be a connection and uh, this kind of relevance in terms, even if it's not like global events in terms of the way in which it can shift how we, it, it can shift our understanding of um, how like history is formed or something like that. So it, it needs to point to like these kinds of uh, these, it needs to showcase some kind of relevance in new ways of teaching history or not history, but any kind of subject matter. I'm just going to history because that's my department. Um, so just, you need to highlight that. Um, yeah, so the next point was kind of related to what I was talking about with publications. Um, always include them in your CV. I mean, this is for any application. It doesn't have to even just be for Fulbright Hayes. Um, you, you, you basically should have a running list of anything that you've published, anything that you've been presenting on at research conference and so on and so forth on your CV. Um, and then uh, plan a way to contact your uh, recommenders in case of last minute. Yes. So um, as we probably all know, it's very difficult sometimes to get a hold of your advisors. Um, so just make sure you let them know that there is this quick turnaround that happens once you start submitting your Fulbright haze. And it would require a kind of quicker response from them when necessary in case something happens or in case something changes. Um, but yeah, and then again, ask a friend or colleagues outside of your department to review your proposal. This is so important because as I, me as I mentioned before, um, the people that are looking at your application are not specialists in what you're focusing on. So it needs to, it, you need to be speaking to an educated audience, but that's not a specialist in your field. Um, and yeah, uh, Olivia, do you have anything to add? I think that's most of it. I mean, that last point is huge. If you have the chance to trade grant applications with other grad students, either in your department or outside of it, because I'm sure everyone is applying for grants um, so you'll find others who are and just sharing grant opportunities, reading each other's work is a really huge and important part of the process. Um, I know I always feel like guilty asking people to do things, but really it's reciprocal. It's something that you just it's part of the practice of being a grad student. Um, so I really recommend that earlier you start getting in the practice of sharing the better. Um, and yeah, I mean, Kristen was just really incredibly helpful. Um, pointing out like, what is this jargon or bring forth this other aspect that was um, such an amazing and helpful part of the process for me. Um, and then yeah, working on the CV early is, is good. I think that I always try to update it every month so that it doesn't become this huge burden. So just working on it a little bit every time because you'll have to make changes for the Fulbright one. I know I had to add coursework, um, like methods training. I don't usually include on my CV. Um, so just getting it as up to date as possible ahead of time is great. Um, yeah, and that's it for me. I just want to emphasize some of the great points that uh, Caroline and Olivia made, which is um, so one with <laughs> with the way to contact your recommenders and language evaluators last minute. It, ha it has happened more than once where I'll look at things like, oh, this faculty forgot to include how many months they know you so and so I need you to go back and have the faculty redo the form or you know like oh they forgot to put you know this on here or this is missing or they didn't check these questions um so you know those things they, they come up right um and then the point about uh getting if you can get a hold of someone's application and actually even their technical review I'm just going to tell you it's valuable whether they got it or not because you can see, it, even if they didn't get it, you can see what got picked apart and what things were missing. So you're like, oh, that didn't get emphasized. I need to, I need to emphasize that. I need to include that. So you don't have to just reach out to people you know who applied and got it. Reach out to people you know who applied and didn't get it. So you know what didn't work and what you, you can work on as well. So um, just wanted to kind of add those. Um, but we, we have about 12 minutes left for questions and answers. Uh, so very happy to take any of those. Uh, I know that someone earlier was uh, mentioning something about eligibility. Uh, so I do wanna go over that. Uh, let me just go ahead and stop sharing my screen real quick. 
Okay. Uh, so as far as eligibility, you don't have to be ABD when you apply. Uh, you just have to be ABD by the time you would start the fellowship. So we do have students who apply who haven't even done their um, proposal defense yet. Um, like maybe you're planning to do it by the end of spring. So you've already been working with your committee on, on putting things together and you're at that step. But we also have students who they just finished their proposal defense. Um, so, you know, they'll be ABD by next semester, uh, you know, uh, or by, by summer or fall, whatnot. Um, so again, you don't have to be ABD at time of application just by the time that you would start the fellowship. Um, so someone's asking, what type of oversight or monitoring happens during the fellowship period? Are you expected to check, to check in or report during your progress? Um, so this is actually a great question. A um, couple things. So as far as with me, uh, you and I just would stay in touch about monitoring the budget and expenses and just kind of check in with you. Just, I also just want to know how you're doing. <laughs> um, it's my responsibility to make sure that things are going okay um, and that we're staying in touch and if anything's changed um, and to support you with that. You should be, of course, in contact with your host affiliate in country and working with them. Okay. Um, and then as far as your dissertation committee uh, and your faculty advisor, you should have regular meeting set up to um, you know update them on how things are going and working things out um, but Caroline maybe because you you know you're you had boots on the ground um, for eight months you can maybe you can explain a little bit about how that went for you yeah um so I, I was in contact with you for like pretty much every month, letting me like you were letting me know um, when my funding was coming in. Um, asked, and then I was updating you about my project allowance and so on and so forth. So um, during that process, you will be photographing for Christ, uh, Kristen your receipts for your project allowance. So please, please, please keep all of your receipts for everything um, on that process. Uh, in terms of uh, my dissertation committee, I would email my advisor once every, it wasn't, it wasn't very strict. I would let her know if I'm having issues in a host a country or issues with an archive, that kind of thing um, that she can advise me on just because she's also had, has had experience um, as well. Um, the institutions, your host institutions though, there might be, they might have different monitoring. So uh, for my time in Spain, I was required to meet, uh, I, I, I went to a couple of talks that was held by my host institution. Um, they met with me to see what they could do for me. Um, and yeah, and then uh, in the Philippines, uh, my host institution, um, they essentially helped me, um, they needed like a list, they wanted to know what archives or what museums and what institutions I needed to get to because they were the ones that were required to make the introductions. So they needed to get, kind of know where you were. In addition to that, uh, for Ateneo, they have this requirement for me specifically that um, because I received um, affiliation with them, I am required to speak like eight, like six months after my leave date from the Philippines, uh, I would, I'm required to go back and actually, or Zoom call, I'm not too sure. Um, it, they said it's going to depend on where I am. Um, but I have to kind of report on what I was doing in the Philippines and uh, what I utilize my affiliation for. So in a way, there's that kind of monitoring that's actually happening by my host institution, more so than um, the larger body of Fulbright Hayes. Um, so, uh, so the monitoring is more so you need to be aware of it with regards to the requirements of your host institution. So you have to be in communication with them and ask them what they, what you need, what you got to tell them what you need from them and they will tell you what they need from you later on. Um, there is also a part of the application where you literally have to address your plan for staying in touch with your dissertation committee. And if you miss that, you're gonna miss points. And I've actually seen applicants get docked points for that. So, so you do wanna make sure that you decide on a plan and detail that out. It normally just takes like a, like one or two sentences to address in your narrative. Um, the other thing which I, 
I want to tack on to what Caroline said is, you know, DDRA is looking to fund well prepared qualified researchers. They're not looking for novice researchers. Um, so to the points that Olivia and Caroline made earlier, anything that you can include on your CV to show research experience. And again, what your um, you know, recommenders can include to speak to your qualified research, like they've, you know, seen you work on this project, they know what your experience is with this, you're, you're extremely qualified with this type of method, and, you know, whatnot, um, those all will just bolster your application. So, other questions? And while we wait for any other questions with our remaining time, um, Olivia, Caroline, are there any, like, just final tips you really want to leave um, prospective applicants with? Um, well, I guess, I mean, it's also part of the application process because you're going to have to start thinking about it soon is um, your the visa requirements, because sometimes you might not meet the visa requirements to your research country. Um, I, I remember that was a question that actually emerged when uh, we had the Fulbright Hayes Q, uh, question and answer um, after people were accepting, like they were some students were like, oh, I can't, I, I don't meet the research requirements for a visa. So you might have to be a, pretty a hyper aware of some of the visa requirements while you're applying for the Fulbright haze because they do take a while as well. Olivia? Um, I was trying to think if there's anything we didn't cover. I think maybe one would be, um, just thinking through the timeline because you you find out about Fulbright um, like mid semester <laughs> in the fall. So in terms of funding and your timeline and all of that, it's just good to plan ahead. I think in my head, I was like, oh, if I don't get the Fulbright, I'll just head to field work. But it's like, oh, you need to commit to maybe a GA ship in the semester. So just thinking through the timeline and what works for you and having backup plans is just a good practice to be in um and then hopefully it all works out really well like it did for us so yeah good luck everyone yeah so speaking to that so again just a reminder the award period for the fy24 competition um is anticipated to be for field work starting january 2025 and ending by march 2026 for a period of six to 12 months so that's that's what you could anticipate Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions. So I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Mahalo to Caroline and Olivia uh, for sharing about their experiences, uh, you know, fellows and applicants and, and Caroline for your time abroad. If you do have questions, again, please feel free um, to reach out to me and let me know if you are planning to apply I just drop my email in the chat box again. Everyone enjoy your weekend and take care. This concludes our session.